Hey guys, it's Nick, and in this video, I want to do an update on what's going on with Archegos Capital Management, the latest, uh, the details that's coming out on the huge positions of CFDs that they had with multiple prime brokerages. So I'm going to talk about what CFDs are, and I'm going to talk about what happened, the whole timeline, apparently, of what we know so far on how this thing happened, what triggered the blow up, and uh you know why some of these prime brokerages are taking huge losses like nomura and uh cs first boston and while other ones like goldman sachs uh are not so let's start with cfds what are cfds uh cfds are contracts for difference and it's basically it's basically like placing a bet with a bookie <laughs> okay um let's say you think Apple is going to go up and it's $200 a share, but you don't have, you know, $200,000 to buy a thousand shares of it. So you place a bet with somebody who takes your bet. In this case, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, one of these guys, and it's a contract. And you say, okay, um, I want to buy exposure to a thousand shares of Apple. And they go, okay, well, that costs $200,000. But if you put up $20,000, we will give you that exposure as if you had a thousand shares or put up two hundred thousand dollars. Meaning, for every dollar it moves up, you'll make a thousand dollars. For every dollar it moves down, you'll lose a thousand dollars. But of course, if it goes down twenty points, you lose twenty thousand dollars. You're completely wiped out. So it's giving you a ten percent margin. Meaning, with uh, with $1,000, you can buy $10,000 worth of exposure to the stock. You're not actually buying that stock. You don't own it. You don't own anything. You just have the contract between you and the broker saying, hey, whichever way it goes, if it goes up, you make money. If it goes down, you lose money. And that's it. Oddly enough, uh, CFDs have been around for probably like 100 years or more. Um, they were called bucket shops back then. And so if you read the book, Reminiscence of a Stock Operator, there's a really good description of it. And there were basically storefronts that would have a feed, you know, the ticker tape from the New York Stock Exchange, and they would post all the prices of the stocks. And you could come in there kind of like, you know, betting on a horse, you're betting on a stock. If GE is $100 a share, you can put down $100 and say, give me 100 shares of GE. And they go, sure, no problem. Now, you didn't buy anything. You just bought the right to make money if it goes up and lose money if it drops a dollar. So you have 100 shares for $100. If it goes up a dollar, you doubled your money. If it goes down a dollar, you're wiped out. And um, what would happen with these bucket shops is if too many people bet on the same side, let's say everybody came in and they had thousands of dollars on GE to be long, uh, a lot of times they would have these uh, raids. They would call the people on the floor of the exchange and pay them to smack the stock down to the point where it wipes out all the punters uh, in the bucket shop. So uh, that is something that happened 100 years ago and a different form of that still happens on Wall Street now. So that still kind of goes on now. If you have a really big position and other people find out about it, um, and they see that you have a weak position or it's going down, uh, they add to that pressure to make you sell. That happened with long-term capital management when they blew up and Warren Buffett had to come in and uh, save the day and buy them out and stuff. And it seems like it could have been happening here. Uh, and that's part of the reason maybe why Bill Wong had multiple prime brokerages because his positions were so big that if he had all of those positions at any one, any one prime brokerage uh, and word got out, uh, you could be sure that they would find a way to test his, uh, test his metal or test his capital, so to speak, to really put pressure on those positions if they smelled any kind of weakness. So he spread it around through multiple prime brokerages, uh, possibly as a way to kind of prevent that, but also possibly as a way to prevent uh, the SEC rules of ownership positions. So if you are a 5% ownership, you have to register with the SEC in any one stock. And if you have a 10% ownership, you have to report your trades after two days to the SEC. 
and there's all kinds of other rules. You're considered an insider. So if you own Viacom stock and you have 3% with Goldman Sachs and 5% with Morgan Stanley and 4% with Credit Suisse, you know, you're over that 10% threshold. But since the prime brokerages don't know what's going on, they don't know. And so uh, that could be a way around it. And also the CFDs as well, because it's not a reportable thing on an exchange. So by buying the CFDs, you're kind of anonymous to your position size. And so what also helped him skirt some of these rules is that his fund is so-called family office. And so they have less uh, reporting regulations. They don't have to file the 13F and these kinds of things. Um, and so this is something that's common for people that are kind of out of the game, so to speak. Uh, you know, an old one is Jeffrey Vinnick, who ran uh, Fidelity's Magellan Fund. You know, he retired and had a family office. Uh, George Soros stopped his fund and now just has a family office where he manages his own money. And so this is what Bill Wong was supposed to be doing, which, you know, you would think that they kind of take it easy and don't do anything too risky. But apparently he had like $10 billion in capital or somewhere around there, and he leveraged it up depending on uh, you know, who you talk to in, the, in these articles, anywhere from 50 billion to 100 billion. So he was doing five to 10 times leverage on these positions using a lot of CFDs. And so if he had all of these positions in CFDs that didn't actually buy any stock with any of these brokerages, why were these big block trades being sold uh, Friday and Monday and all of that? Uh, two reasons. It wasn't all CFDs. Some of it was stock that he had bought. But the other thing is, if you're a Goldman Sachs and you get into a position of, you know, a $2 billion CFD on Viacom or something like that, the hedge, you're going to buy some Viacom stock. You may not buy $2 billion worth. I don't know, you know, what their models are or whatever, but they bought some stock uh, to hedge that kind of short position is what they're doing. How did this all start to unravel? Uh, it started to unravel with Baidu and Farfetch. Uh, Mid-March, they both started uh, coming down a bit. And so that put you know, some kind of pressure on his, on his positions. I don't know how big his positions in those stocks were, but that put some hurting on him. And then the final nail in the coffin was March 22nd when Viacom did a secondary uh, stock offering uh, for common stock and a preferred stock issue it was like $3 billion total. And that started uh, to get the stock going down and people started shorting it. And so that started the ball rolling and he had a really big position in Viacom. And so it just kind of snowballed from there. He tried to sell some apparently and um, you know, selling into a falling market, it just made things worse. And in the article, they say by Thursday, Archegos got a bunch of their prime brokerages together to kind of <laughs> let them know what's going on because they didn't know each other's exposure. And so I, once they all got into the same room or conference call or whatever it was, and they started to realize that they have big exposure and so do these other prime brokerages that have the same kind of exposure, uh, they're all looking at each other, probably going like, you know, who's going to be the first one to blink and sell? Now, the, the reason for that meeting was to kind of find a way to work their way out of it without everybody just dumping the stock just to beat the guy next to them that has the same position. But that's kind of what happened. Um, Goldman was the first to start dumping the stock on Friday. Morgan Stanley dumped stock. But apparently, Nomura... Credit Suisse, Wells Fargo did not dump stock. And so you see that uh, I think Morgan Stanley dumped some stock Sunday night and Wells Fargo dumped like $2 billion on Monday. And so Nomura, I don't know what they were doing, but you know they're one of the biggest losers in this. They already said that they're down like $2 billion because of a customer's losses. And uh, they didn't name Archegos, but it's Archegos uh, apparently. Uh, same with Credit Suisse, uh, the estimates are anywhere from $1 billion to $4 billion in losses from this Archegos thing. You know, there's a saying, he who panics first, panics best. And uh, that's probably what happened in this situation, and there's no honor in Wall Street. Uh, so uh, I, I just imagine the call going something like this. 
you know, uh, Morgan Stanley sees that they have to liquidate this Viacom or something, and it's like, hmm, I wonder if other people are in the same position as we are. Uh, we heard that they have accounts with Goldman maybe and some other ones, and they call up Goldman and they say, hey, Goldman, uh, you know, you know this guy, Bill Wong and Archer goes, you guys do business with them? And Goldman's like, uh, yeah, we do, we do some business. Oh, because uh, you got like uh, 45 billion shares, of, you know, 45 million shares of Viacom that they stuck us with that we're gonna have to liquidate. Uh, you don't have any of that, do you? And Goldman's like, no, nah, no, nah, we don't have any of that, but uh, you probably should probably wait off a little bit on that, you know, probably, probably recover and work itself out. Hold on a second. Hey, 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 John, sell the crap out of Viacom right now. Dump everything. Dump anything we have with Archigos quickly before everybody else on the street figures it out and starts dumping as well. So uh, that's my impression of how that call or meeting or, you know, conversation went on Wall Street. Because once they smell blood and they, and they wake up and they go, wait a minute. We gave this guy all this credit, all this concentration, and he got the same position at five other prime brokerages. So the risk of that is, you know, four or five times greater than this individual risk that we have. Uh, they know that, you know, there's going to be a lot of selling. So whoever sells first sells best. And apparently, in this case, Goldman <laughs> won that race, uh, you know, not surprisingly, right? So guys, that's the latest saga on Archigos. Uh, it's yet to be seen if there's more selling from this, if there's more um, damage to the stock market, if there's other uh, hedge funds that have similar positions because they all talk together and they use the same ideas a lot of times. So there could be more damage out there. And looking at the trading today in Viacom and some of these other stocks that they were dumping, you see that uh, they are not ready to bounce back yet. Uh, there was no you know, big fall and then a quick snap back. It was just kind of like a, a gradual weak looking market on these stocks. So I don't think they're there yet. Who knows, tomorrow could be different, we'll see. But, um, you know, I, I don't think we've heard the end of this yet. And already uh, FINRA is, you know, gonna have a meeting with all the principals involved in all of this and stuff, uh, you know, Joe Biden is aware of the situation and is monitoring and all this nonsense, you know, so uh, this thing could get bigger or it could be the end of it. I don't know, but uh, it's very interesting. And, you know, this guy, Bill Wong, was pretty much uh, flying under the radar for a long time. And now this blow up, you know, has him all over the place. So I hope you got a little better understanding on what's going on here. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up and I'll see you on the next one, guys. Thanks for watching.